Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to talk the Journey Within podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Allen, and I got a special stroke survivor for you this morning. Believe it or not, coming to you from the Middle East. And her name is Sybil Jones. And I, I'm really excited to let you jump right into it. I'll be your on and be the popper. Well, good morning, Sybil. Hello, Aaron. You are coming from the Middle East. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I do not expect that. That kind of sent me back a little bit. Great to have you. Thank you for being here, Sybil. Thank you. I think it's, it's evening over here. It's almost my it's bedtime. Not, here. That's right. We should talk about that. But... Hey, now, Sybil, you, you are a stroke survivor. You had just stroke at the young age of 41, I think you said. Why did you first introduce yourself, introduce yourself formally, and then just head right into your story? All right. So my name is Sybil Jones, and um, I am a stroke survivor. I'm a mother of three teenage girls, um, and I am a Navy spouse which is why I'm now here in Bahrain. Um, I had my stroke at 43. Um, we were, at that time we were living in Washington, DC and I've had no, no indications of a stroke, no health risk, nothing. Carotid webbing, a rare cause. And, you know, I kind of joke a little bit about it, um, but to know me having a rare cause for stroke, it kind of fits, right? Because I'm I, I'm a rare individual. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you, so you had no early warning signs before you stroke, because you told me in the room room before the podcast, you were at a party. And tell me a little bit about what happened during that time that you were told. You, you you don't remember, but tell me what happened. Yes, we were um, at a party for my husband. Um, it was April 17th of 2021. We were preparing to PCS or move as, you know, the military calls it a PCS from Washington, D.C. to San Diego. So we're literally at a party. I was doing what I do best, talk. I um, jokingly say that my gift of gab <laughs> saved my life because um, <laughs> I was just literally talking. But earlier that day, because I'm, can I back up to earlier? Please, that day? Please. I had been out with my daughter. My middle daughter rides horses, so I had been out at the barn with her all day, um, running errands. I felt fine. I had no indications of feeling ill. I never felt sick, nothing. I was perfectly fine. I was the designated driver that night because the party was for my husband. So, you know, let him enjoy his time, have maybe three drinks instead of two. So I'm like, hey, I'm the designated driver. <laughs> um, we were eating dinner talking, having a good time. He was sitting at a separate table because again, I'm a talker. Um, and there's a, a period of time that I do not recall. So this is just from what I've been told. Um, one of the gentlemen next to me said that he noticed my speech slur, but he thought I was joking. He was like, I thought you were just telling a story, but he's like, no, um, I couldn't see anything. Like, I do remember everything just going black and voices then faint. But I thought, oh, like there was a split second that I was thinking, oh, maybe because I was, I was drinking a beer, but I only had a couple of sips. But he said he ran down, got my husband. This was all within a matter of seconds. And my husband said that by the time he got to the end of the table, he had looked down and he said, I had a blank stare on my face. So he thought I was upset with him. But, you know, I'm like, dude, 
I don't even recall seeing you. Like what? But he said he came down and my the full left side of my face had drooped. So full paralysis and unconscious slapped my face on the table. And I joke, here, here's another little, and I think it's more so for myself when I make these jokes. I'm like, at least I didn't mess up my face. <laughs> We we were at a brewery. We were at a brewery. The party was at a brewery. So it's a picnic table, right? I was like, okay. Um, I don't recall anything. I, I just remember waking up in the hospital, being asked if I knew where I was, what happened. There were tubes coming out of And I'm like, no, I don't know where I am. I don't know why I'm here. Other than y'all just keep telling me I had a stroke. But how did I have a stroke <laughs> that, you know, cause I had no health concerns, none whatsoever. Now, you know, did you know the man, the man that actually helped save your life, the guy that saw the early signs of stroke, the, the slurred speech. I mean, he, he, he immediately got your husband that right there really helped you a lot. So did you know, or was he a stranger? He actually worked with my husband. Um, so everyone around us that evening, they worked with my husband. I had never met them, though. Um, and I did get to visit with them before we left D.C. Um, because I was in the I ended up being in the hospital for a week. Um, and I see you and then they moved me to the stroke unit and they searched for the cause of my stroke, which comes to find out it was a rare cause called carotid webbing. Like, whoa, kind of fit with me, right? I'm, I'm a rare individual. <laughs> <laughs> love, love your energy, it's great. Carotid webbing, I don't think I've ever heard of that. What, is that, what does that mean, carotid webbing, webbing? So here in my carotid artery, it's a, like extra shelf in your carotid artery that um, it makes it, thin, it's a thin membrane that's there. So a little extra, I just call it my little extra skin that was there that um, caused the blood here to just it continue to circulate. And they believe that that particular day it circulated and then it just got caught in the spin and it broke loose, blood clot to the brain. They said it was deep within the right center side of my brain. Now, what depths, I'm curious, what deficit did you have then? You obviously looked like you didn't have a stroke. I have, you know, which I, I know I've met many, I've met several people I get their fortune up. But what deficit did you have that you don't have now that you're the Kim pulled out of that you actually rebuild your life from? Um, my left side weakness. So, and I still deal with left side weakness and numbness. And Aaron, this is this is probably very personal, but I think it's important to share. Um, when I say it, this is kind of personal. Um, but it's go ahead, it's go ahead. Um, the my entire left side of my body. So when I say my entire left side of my body, um, once I was cleared to get back to, to life, um, I am married, um, so I'm grown. Um, I, I, again, this is this is a little hard for me to, to say, but well, no, I'll, uh, say, I'll tell you, I think I knew you're grown, so during sex. You have, yeah. you, have, you have a numbness, you have a numb sensation, which is very odd. And I think it's great we're talking about this because it needs to be talked about part of stroke. It's what's real about stroke. So I'm very fortunate that, that now, so you sense that you were not, you were feeling a dullness, a no sensation. Yes. And like when I first talked to my doctor about it, I was like, I don't really know how to explain 
the entire left side. You know, because people, you think, oh, your arm, your leg, which hey, I no, you, you, not, not <laughs> I have you know, in, my, in my foot. Um, there's times, even still to this day, when I'm walking, like I just don't feel the ground. Like there isn't, I, and I just have to mentally say, you're fine. Your left leg is making connection with the ground. You're fine. Just keep walking. But for the longest, like I just could not, like I was terrified to walk. I was terrified. Like I would pick things up and drop it because I just couldn't feel it with my left hand. But people are like, oh, but you look normal. You're fine. I'm like, yeah, I I look fine, but there's things, there's the invisible deficits that you don't, that you don't see. You know, people want to take a pause for one second. That invisible thing, the simple sign about it, it's like, cause, I mean, I'm pretty honest, so I sound like I'm a thud, but there are many survivors out there, main injury survivors, but there are many survivors out there that have invisible deficits. You know, you look at Sybil and say, oh, well, she's just, I mean, a stroke survivor. Well, she is. She is a survivor. Now, so you had that numbness when you first had your stroke. So you still deep with a little bit out now where you left the arm, you're not like numb. Speech is doing great, but you have a lot you get, get for gab, which you told me earlier. You like the talks, which is really great. Now, what did your husband do? I'm curious. What do I, I picked your husband kind of over to the table. Seeing you there at the table, people around him telling you, telling him she's having a stroke. What happened during that? What did, what's the reaction? He said that as soon as he saw me when he got to the end of the table, that he knew it was a stroke because his grandmother had a stroke when he was younger. So he immediately called 911, um, told the dispatchers, my wife is having a stroke. And they were there immediately, um, took me to... Um, we were living in Northern Virginia at the time. So I went to a Nova Fairfax um, hospital and they took, it wasn't Fairfax. It was a Nova. It was another Nova hospital. They took me there, administered the TPA. Is it the TPA? TPA? What yeah, it, TPA um, yeah. um, it didn't take, um, which they, my husband said they had asked him about administering it. He was like, yes. They were like, it didn't take, we need to transport her. And, you know, he was like, they were telling him what they could do and what they needed him to sign. And he was like, that, that, that was hard for him because we had daughters. We had three daughters at home. Um, our oldest was actually out that night with her softball team. And so he said, while I was in surgery, she had called my phone to ask if she could stay out later. One of his coworkers went to our house and stayed with the younger two kids. And, um, but, you know, she just told him, hey, your mom, there's an emergency. I'll be with you until your dad can get home. Okay. But he said that when the oldest, she was 16 at the time. So my kids were 16, 14, and 12 at the time. Um, called to see if she could stay out later. He told her no. And she asked. And he yelled at her. And he is not a yeller. He's like, no, you've got to go home now. So and then he ended up having to tell her what was going on. So she got home and told her sisters what was going on. Well, you would not, you don't need to talk about this. I think it's kind of, we need to bring it up. Because I had my stroke at age 47 and brain injury is stroke at age 47. But most people like myself and like you, what I understand, we talked about that we always thought stroke happened to 80 year old people, not young people like us. Right. Right. So, what, so that's what we want to tell. There's one thing at this, I want the podcast to realize it doesn't happen to tell people, look, sip, I'll look at me. Somebody you had said you're 42, right? 43. I was four, I was forty three when I had. Okay, you were forty three. I was forty seven. I know I know younger people even than us that had strokes. So it does happen. So out there, 
the signs that Sybil saw, the, the, the uh, slurred speech, face chirping, uh, arm weakness. I mean, those are all signs. Dial 911 right away. Right away. That guy, Sybil, that guy that realized you had slurred speech at the beginning, he actually wanted to actually instigate it, save you, help you save your life. Yes. And I got to see him before we moved. So um, uh, let me let me back up a little bit of being in the hospital. Um, I was in the hospital at the tail end of COVID. Right? Oh, great. 2021. Um, but while I was in the hospital, um, they were trying to determine the cause of my stroke, which that's when they figured the carotid went. So I now have this, and I, I had a little one that I used to keep on my desk, but when we moved, it got lost somewhere in the move, but I have a stent here in my right carotid artery now here in my neck. I call it my, um, my snazzy neck jewelry. That's what I call it. (laughs) Yeah. My snazzy neck jewelry. So after I was discharged from the stroke, I went home and then a couple of weeks later, I went back in the hospital for the stent placement. But when we were cleared to move, because my husband was supposed to have been leaving, going to San Diego in May. And I was going to move with my daughters in June when school was out. Um, But the Navy did push him back. They were like, okay, we're going to allow you to stay in D.C. with your wife until she is cleared to move. Um, So we all did move to, to San Diego in June. And I continued my care there. But before we left for San Diego, I did meet with the guy. We had them come over. They came over for dinner. And and I'm not a hugger, but I hugged him. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Because he could have easily, although he was part of the party, could have easily dismissed me. Yeah. Like, what? What is this lady doing? What's wrong with her? I know you got a brewery. You have so speech. I mean, come on. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, you know, people, oh, you're at you're drinking beer, although yeah. it was just a little bit of beer that I had, but it could have been easily dismissed as oh. And now anytime I'm out, if I see anyone who their balance is off a little bit or I hear a slight slur, I stop. I'm like, hey, because I want to know, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is this a stroke or you or have you had too many to drink? All right. You know, Sybil, I want to touch on that for one side because it's really, really important. I mean, my podcast, we really want to raise stroke awareness. And I think here you see this. I just amazed at that because People listen for people having slurred speech. Listen for them acting funny and mentally cognitively. Dead, don't assume they're drunk. I knew one stroke survivor that was going to a bank. And he began to get real slurred speech. He began to fall over. And either cop came up to him and assumed he was drunk. They were going to arrest him. He was having a stroke. And he goes, I'm not, I am, he's trying to speak and speak. I mean, a, anyway, I came here upon somebody. I'm saying, uh, like, so I'm going to do the same thing with, because listen for people, listen for those signs of stroke, because you could save someone's life. Yes. Yes. I like, I'm always vigilant now. If I'm out, I'm like, are they okay? Or if I see someone like, and they, because like for me, I didn't have any signs to say, oh, let me go sit down and, and rest. There was nothing. It was just kind of like, boom, it hit. Boom, yeah. But I'm like, you know, if I see someone who is, seems to be acting a little off, off, let, let me go make sure they're okay. (laughs) Okay. Like, I, I do think about those things. And even when I, like, I don't have a slur because I listen to myself speak all the time now. But when I talk, I hear a slur. Even talking to you right now, I hear a slur when I, when I speak. And my tongue 
always feels heavy. Like my tongue, like, and I will say, Aaron, I am a little self-conscious. Like I used to love, and I still talk to people, but I, it, I now have to work up to talking to people, um, but doing videos. I used to love doing videos, but I'm so self-conscious now. So getting myself together today, I was like, come on, Sybil, you can do this. You can do this. Well, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, Sybil, I've been doing this for about seven years. You, I mean, your energy, your, don't be afraid to let your light shine because it's great. And I think you're... Uh, Watching for people's signs, I've start deaf slow speech is something we can all learn from because just so people know the the definition is fast. Be fast, face stripping, arm stripping, meaning if you think someone's some a stroke, put your arms out, but one more droop. Speech your speech is slurred. I still have it. I have just like that. Slow speech. Uh, and then a uh, time. You think anybody's having, look what happened with Sybil. You think anybody is having any signs of stroke, even if you're wrong. I would rather, and Sybil would rather have you go to the hospital and get checked out than not at all. Because most most people, Sybil, out there, they know it. They, they brush the oh, I'm just tired. I need to sit down. I'm just, whatever. Yes. And time, the time is so important because that's one thing which my husband didn't talk to me about it for months after. Um, and he finally sat down and he talked to me about it. And he was like, look. Because, you know, I'm like, dude, I'm fine. I'm fine. He was like, look, he was like, time was of the essence. If we were anywhere else that night, He's like, you would not be here. Possibly, yes. Right now. And he and he I was like, oh, he was like, no, he's like, Sybil, seriously. <laughs> he was like, you he was like, it is a miracle that you are sitting here, standing here, talking to me right now. And I'm like, no, dear, no. He was like, no. And I have thought about that too, because on most evenings, I'm like, I would have been home in the bed. Like, like yeah, my poor husband yeah. rolled over and, and I, you know, I looked at my scans and I was like, oh, I was like, that's my brain. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, huh. this is, I'm like, I had, I really had a stroke. Like this wasn't a warning shot. Like I really had a full blown severe stroke i'm like oh. i'm like thank god for all for everyone who was around me or the medical team and for the surgeon who argued my he said he argued my case for a week about the cause of it and then my husband well, agreeing for them to go in and um because i went back to the hospital for the stint for the stent placement I was only supposed to be in for a day. It was a day procedure. Well, I stayed an entire week wow. because my blood pressure plummeted and they couldn't stabilize it. I'm like, I can't do anything simple, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it just means, well, thank you. A great support team. Really, the song has been very supportive. And we'll pause a minute. Because I have the most respect for people that serve our country. Let's give your husband, would you please mention his name, what branch of the service in the Monopolis that says they can serve our country? Okay. Um, he is Navy um, Captain Marcus Jones. Captain? Yes. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah, Marcus Jones, thank you for serving our country. I want to pause, take a minute, because I have a lot of respect for people like you. And thank you very much for serving our country. So, anyway, Sybil, now I'm curious. Did you, were you able to walk your, your time 
Here's a prime example. So there's a wound of tongue that occurs after stroke. They cannot administer TPA. So do they, you, do they do you, tell me a little about the TPA. Do you remember anything from that time when they were in the hospital? I do not. Um, just from what my husband told me, that they administered the TPA, it did not work. So they transported me to Fairfax. I was at a different ANOVA hospital in Virginia. They transfer, um, transported me to ANOVA Fairfax, where they um, ended up doing a thrombectomy. So they went in through my groin, I, I, up through and into the brain and pulled out the clot, which I asked my husband. I was like, did you ask to keep it? He's like, <laughs> I don't think I've ever really been saying that on my podcast. Did you keep that blood clot? <laughs> I'm like, did you keep it? Did you did you get a picture of it? Anything? Yeah, but more it's kind of like a remembrance of a memento from the kids. Yeah. yeah, he was like, Sybil, I wasn't thinking anything. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's what he's like. Is. I was scared and I was trying, I'm like, I but, you know, that's where my mind went. Did you keep it? <laughs> yeah, you definitely. You, know, you should be on social I don't know your social media, but, you know, I'm telling you, you should be on social media because <laughs> your energy is great. But, you know, so, but I want to think if the, the, what would you tell? We're down the last three minutes of the podcast. What advice would you give a newer stroke survivor? Say someone just had a stroke. You, what advice would you give them? Oh, well, Aaron, my first piece of advice would be for me to put my glasses on when I'm when I'm spelling out stroke because I'm looking at where I type stroke survivor and I put <laughs> I'm just seeing that I misspelled stroke, so make sure. Uh -huh, okay, to well, I can't <laughs> sorry, 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 joke, joke, sorry. bad joke, bad joke. I'm just seeing that when I typed it out, I'm like, Sybil, we probably needed your glasses. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, sorry. Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, don't worry about that. Honey. You don't worry. But no, my, my piece of advice for a stroke survivor would be to give yourself grace. That would be my first piece of advice. Grace, um, grace. To give yourself grace because. I, you know, I understand, you know, you, you're like, I want to do, you want to be, you want to get back to your old self, right? Like, oh, I can do this. I can go back to doing what I was doing before my stroke. It's okay. It's okay. Things are going to be different. Things are going to be different for you. Even if your deficits are invisible, things will be different and take care of your mental health um, you know after stroke i know everyone focuses on the physical therapy occupational therapy and speech therapy but have someone you can talk to um, yeah you and i've talked about that a little bit i don't mean to interrupt you but uh, i just think mindset i told you that I believe it's so to be CEO and so to be media that most people out there say, I oh, want to get back, they recover. Well, I hate to tell you the truth, you won't recover. You're not going to recover. You're going to rebuild your life. You can, you rebuild a more meaningful life than you ever had. I, I had, and like a lot of people, love, but you're not going to recover who you were. You will always be a stroke survivor. You know, and I really, you know, I think simple brings up a really, really good point. I mean, be patient with yourself. You're seeing Sybil, who has very hidden deficits. You see me as very obvious deficits. But we're still both true survivors. Survive something kill most people. Sybil, I cannot thank you enough for being here. I really, really want to thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. 
All right. Well, we're pretty much out of time. I thank you again. Thank you for the separate country. Thank you for letting people know we're out there. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye.